One of the great advantages and joys to using a lectionary for the divine service scripture readings is the way that the readings have been chosen to illuminate each other, especially the Old Testament and Gospel readings in the case of the lectionary that we're using. Today, both of these readings are using agricultural metaphors to talk about the Word of God and the power that it has to bring life. It's not the same metaphor, though, exactly. In our reading from Isaiah, the word is likened to rain. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. And in our reading from the book of Matthew, the word is likened to seed. For example, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. And as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. And in connection with this difference, there's another difference, namely that the Isaiah passage is dealing with the whole earth at one time, or at least the whole land of Israel, contrasting it to the heavens from whence the rains come. And so it's able to say that the rain makes the earth bring forth and sprout. And likewise, that God's word shall not return empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose, namely the salvation of Israel. The Matthew passage, on the other hand, recognizes that not all parts of the earth bring forth equally. And the parable there is built around that fact not contrasting the earth to the heavens, but rather different parts of the earth to each other. So we have two different sowing metaphors, but they don't conflict with each other. They fit together beautifully, in fact, in a way that encourages us to conclude that Jesus, among other things, is offering his parable as a commentary and expansion on Isaiah's prophecy, and even the other way around since we're dealing with divine inspiration, to conclude that the Holy Spirit was offering through Isaiah a commentary and expansion on the parable that Jesus was to give seven centuries later. Here's what we learn when we put the two together. First, God's word comes from the heavens. It is not a thing of earth, although it is clad in human language. On the contrary, it is the only thing that can make anything good come out of the earth. And I don't mean that in order to get a crop, you have to go to the field and preach to it. Although it is true that anything that grows out of the earth and the whole earth itself was originally fashioned only by the word of God when he said, let there be. I'm talking about spiritual good. I'm talking about faith and life and the promises of God coming to fruition. The point here is spiritual good, how the earth and all those who live on the earth depend on the word that comes down from heaven for all their knowledge of God, for his law, which in part we can figure out for ourselves, but is only pure and whole when it flows directly from its heavenly source, and especially for his gospel, which we cannot even begin to discover on our own. We are beholden to the rain that comes down from heaven for both of these things and therefore for the true life that springs up in our hearts when we receive that gospel with understanding and trust. Unless that refreshing, enlivening rain comes down from heaven to earth, we of the earth can only be dry and barren. But what does this life-giving word look like when it comes down to us? That is the question the other metaphor answers. The seed is just as necessary as the water. It doesn't matter how wet you get a plot of ground. If there are no good seeds in that soil, no good plants will grow. And the word of God supplies both of these needs. The metaphor in Isaiah is lofty. The life-giving word comes down from on high, from heights that a man cannot scale, and in a way no man can control. The metaphor in our gospel is lowly. A sower went out to sow. Just a man walking on the earth, and a simple man at that. Not a king or a general or a famous artist, simply a farmer. 
the salt of the earth, if you will. And he carries with him seeds, which also have a lowly origin, not from the clouds, but from the last crop that he had that came out of the earth. But this seed in this metaphor is the high and mighty word of God, just as truly as the rain was in the other metaphor. But now its greatness is disguised. Now its heavenly origin is hidden, and it can only be seen with the eyes of faith. If you look with physical eyes, all that you see is its earthly origin. All that you see is a simple man speaking simple words in Greek, a human language. Why? Why this disguise? Because now the word has become flesh and dwelt among us. Now the son who was eternally begotten of his father before all worlds has been born into a human lineage so that you can trace his family tree back to David and back to Abraham and back to Adam. He comes from us. Just as you can trace this year's seed corn back to last year or 10 years ago or 100 years ago. God himself, the Son, by whom and through whom and for whom all things were made, has become also a man of flesh and blood, and thus can easily be mistaken for being only that. This sower, who is the word of God, and hence is also the seed he is sowing, he comes from heaven as surely as the rain does. He is divine and not bound to this earth. He is not dry and dying like those who are. He has the power to bring faith and truth and life out of the ground. But this is not obvious to the people gathered around the boat on that day. His voice is not thundering from Sinai. It's coming just from the lungs and throat of a man. This is how the word descends from heaven to earth. This is what it looks like when it gets here. Even in the first metaphor, the raindrop starts up high, but by the time it gets down to us, it's just water. Put a few thousand of them together, and what do you get? A puddle. There's not much more earthly and humble than a puddle. But it's still the same water. And it might not appear as impressive down here as it was when it was up there but it's a whole lot more useful down here. If it had stayed in the clouds, we wouldn't be eating next season. And the second metaphor makes this point explicit. If the word had remained in heaven, had only shouted down to us from time to time, or even if he had deigned to send us prophets like Moses and Isaiah to lower himself into human mouths in that way, but had refused to come in person, himself, he never would have brought salvation to the earth. We would have been left but nothing, with nothing but the law resounding from on high, telling us what we ought to have done. And as our epistle readings have made clear to us the last few weeks, that could never have saved us. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. The word had to become flesh. God had to become one of us in order to condemn sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that by his righteous life and sacrificial death, he might bring our condemnation to an end and win for us the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The celestial word had to become also an earthly word. The one who opens the treasury of the heavens and sends the rains down to water the earth had to also become a simple sower, walking around Palestine on dirty feet throwing the seed at any given time, only as far as his voice could reach. Training his disciples to be sowers after him. That Jesus is the sower in this parable, and that the types of earth are the crowd who is standing there that day, is clear from this passage. From the verses that were left out when we did our gospel reading, 
Our gospel reading was the parable and the interpretation of the parable. But in between, the disciples go to Jesus and ask him, why do you speak to them in parables? Implied, this is hard for us to understand too. Why are you talking to them in parables? And Jesus replies, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. That is, even when I speak to them clearly, as I have been doing, most of them do not accept my word. They see without seeing, they hear without hearing. So I will not always speak clearly. You will still understand, those of you who are going to see and believe, if for no other reason than that you care enough to come and ask me for the explanation. But they will not, no matter how I say it, and if I put it in a parable, they will not be given extra chances to reject me. And he goes on and he quotes another pro prophecy from Isaiah about people of Israel seeing without seeing and hearing without hearing and how they fail to understand. And three times in three verses, he says that they fail to understand. And then he turns to explain his parable and says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Making the connection clear. These people here, I speak to them in parables because they will not understand anyway. And the ones who do not understand are the first kind of soil. Most of the people in that very crowd were the first kind of soil. Although it was so large, he had to preach to them from a boat. It was going to make very little impact on most of them. The birds would snatch it away as soon as it failed to sink into the ground so that they would not even remember what they had failed to heed in the first place. And in identifying them as the ones who do not understand, he also identifies himself as the sower, the one spreading these seeds, some of which falls by the road. And we may ask, how could such a sower as Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God in human flesh, how could he have so little success in his sowing? The greater part of the crowd is set against God to such an extent that he can speak in riddles and it will make no difference to whether or not they receive his message. And the rest of his hearers, the one who will understand and will receive it, they will not all receive it forever. There are three sections that they are divided into also. There's a group that's going to stop believing because of persecution in the future, the, the rocky soil. They don't have enough of a root. They find the gospel moderately attractive, but not so attractive that tribulation won't drive them away from it. And then there's another group that will be choked off with weeds, meaning the cares of life and the desire for its pleasures, the deceitfulness of riches. Riches always tell you that they can handle the cares of life. We're just talking about workaday cares here, things that you have to take care of, but they can drive the eternal thoughts out of your mind so easily, all the more easy because they are in themselves innocent. And so how many are left who actually hear the word and produce? How can this be the same word in the rain metaphor that always accomplishes what it's sent to do? Well, remember, the passage from Isaiah contrasts the heavens to the earth, not the parts of the earth to each other. The rain makes the earth as a whole produce food, but not every part of the earth. The barren rock does not sprout with food when the rain falls on it. The desert grows some things, but not bread. Even plenty of tracts of good soil are covered with prairies and forests and jungles so that no bread's going to come from them either. And if Jesus were a literal farmer, if he were interested in getting the most grain for his labor, he wouldn't go anywhere near those places. He would sit out there in the boat and look out on that crowd and he would see the rocky terrain and he would see, oh, this isn't worth my time and he would just sail away to somewhere else. 
And when he did so, he would take care to avoid the margins, the hard packed road, the patches of ground that hadn't been sufficiently clear of thorns, the shallow places where he knew nothing much was gonna grow. He would do a cost benefit analysis. And he would say, I'm just gonna stand right here and throw my seed in a circle because this is where the good earth is. And maybe a little over there, but it's a waste to put it anywhere else. But he doesn't do that. The earth is human hearts. And the sower is Christ the Savior who has come to save all those that his Father has given him, all those who will heed his message. He will not neglect the tiny little patches of fertile ground scattered inefficiently here and there and everywhere. He'll throw the seed in great profusion. He'll broadcast over the whole crowd and not care about the waste, just so that the 50 or the 20 or the 10 or the one heart to whom it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven might have that chance to hear those secrets and to believe them and to be saved. And in this way, the earth as a whole brings forth and sprouts, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. And God's word does not return to him void, but accomplishes his purpose. And in God's eyes, this is not a slight or unworthy success. This is not a waste of time that you and I, his little flock, might be forgiven and enjoy his riches forever. Let us treasure the word of God that has come down from heaven through God's great and humble compassion. Let us treasure this word that is preserved in the Holy Bible, that it may continue to feed our faith our whole life long and for all the life of Christ's church here on earth. Let us treasure especially those words that by our Savior's own command have been joined to the water of holy baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to bread and wine and the supper. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins and which was joined to repentance. I forgive you all your sins. These life-giving words that we hear and see and taste are precious beyond anything deceitful riches could buy. And they give the lie to the greatness of any tribulation for they are so much greater the life and the health and the blessedness that they promise is so much greater than any negative thing you could experience in this life. These words will be true and will resound in your ears and will be your life. After all, the treasures and pains of this world are memories. Let us scorn the hot sun and the choking thorns and keep our roots deep in God's word. Let us keep God's law and treasure his saving gospel until that day when the harvest comes and we receive the promised joys. In the name of Jesus, amen.